Well, uh, <clears throat> one more time. Good evening. We are here again to uh, study the word of the Lord. Uh, we will continue our subject about um, hermeneutics. Okay, I'm just arranging our, uh... okay, so uh, I'm sorry it is because uh, of our schedules, so uh, I love to share the word, but because of my hectic schedule, so I did not uh, share the word of God for uh, many weeks. But we will continue this evening our subject about hermeneutics. But before we go on, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this evening. May we ask again your wisdom to be imparted to us that we may comprehend everything that we are going to hear and this evening. Bless us and bless all those brothers and sisters who are listening uh, to this uh, lecture this evening. Thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So we tackled about uh, symbols. We talked about digital symbols uh, the last uh, uh, previous weeks. But now we will continue. Let's talk about the material symbols. Okay. Material symbols. So in contrast to digital uh, symbols, Material symbols consist of things which can be seen, touched, felt, and used by chosen representatives of the people of God or by all the people. These are actual objects which convey a meaning beyond their material use. Let's check. Blood rites involving blood are found among many ancient peoples and are found currently among many primitive religions according to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 23 up to 25. And even uh, Leviticus chapter 17 especially verse 11 makes it clear that the blood itself is a complex. There is that within the blood which plays a role in atonement. Now, the Bible says that we were atoned by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to many verses in the Bible. Secondly is the cherubim. In Hebrew, cherub is found over 90 times in the Old Testament. It is, only, uh, it is found only once in the New Testament. According to Hebrews chapter 5, I'm sorry, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5 to 28, and so on. And I believe you can see. Uh, my lecture notes uh, in the screen. Okay. Now, we have also the embalmatic numbers, names, colors, metals, and jewels. The uh, primary function of numbers is to indicate measurement of time space, quantity, and others. For example, 12 in the Old Testament, it is because there are 12 tribes of Israel. In the New Testament, there are 12 disciples, according to Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Now, in the book of Revelation, the number 12 plays a large role. For example, we have 12,000, each of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
we have 12 crowns of 12 stars. We have 12 gates and 12 angels, 12 foundations. We have the 12 apostles, the 12 kinds of fruits according to the book of Revelation. So, number 12 as the typical number of the unbrokenness of the irreducible completeness of the chocratic people, of the people for God's chosen on possession. Let's talk about colors. Colors are usually a means of aesthetic expression. As with numbers, any symbolic import of colors comes from association. Okay? Uh, this is from. So later on I can, uh, I will edit. Now, ancient colors were not nearly so distinct as ours. Hence, the modern interpreter must see the colors as the ancients saw them rather than as a whole host of distinctly graduated colors. For example, we have the white horse. We are talking about a military conqueror in the Bible. We have the red horse. Active combat in war. We have the black horse. So when we say black horse, we're talking about famine. Yellowish green or pale horse. We are talking about sickness. Talking about death. So we can be sure that this first four seals depict vividly the total effects of war which will prepare the world for the final period of crisis that precedes the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Metals have utilitarian qualities that dictate their use. Of all the emblematic elements, metals and jewels are most difficult. According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 to 45, the vision of the king shows the monetary value of metals. The order goes from the highest to the lowest. The gold, the silver, the brass or bronze, we have the iron, and the mixture of iron and clay. Okay, we'll talk about metals. Okay. So, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 21, we have the 12 gates, and it is full. So, the symbolic import of the 12 gems, an interpreter has every right to doubt that there is any seems to be a collective one. The trust of the total is to picture the beauty, worth, magnificence, and finality of the eternal city. We have also the jewels. We're talking about symbols, material symbols. We have the jewels. Jewels are often introduced because of their beauty and splendor. Names are usually wrote in relative to pinpoint persons and places. For example, according to Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9, their place of worship is no longer God's synagogue, but the synagogue of Satan. So the term synagogue then becomes a symbol of satanic opposition to the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jerusalem 
John calls it the city of Sodom and Egypt according to Revelation chapter 11 verse 8. Now the Judaism out of which Christianity came is viewed as being or having all of the characteristic of Sodom and Egypt. Judaism and Paganism had joined to stamp out Christianity. But very likely, the early Christians felt the Jewish antagonism was sharper. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the emblematic actions. Sometimes, action symbolizes or suggests an idea that lives vividly in the minds of those who observe it or who participate in the action. Now, according to Ezekiel and Revelation, no, both Ezekiel and John, and John were commanded to take a roll or a scroll and eat it. In Ezekiel, This is part of the prophet's call or commission. He is told that his ministry as a prophet is not yet finished. The content of the book which Ezekiel was to eat contained lamentations, mourning, and war. Like much, of the message which he brought to his people. In Revelation, the symbolic action is described in a section which John's call is reaffirmed. So the book which John took and ate seems to have contained a picture of the climax in which God will take his great power and will reign. Okay? Now, the message enters, enter into his whole being. The, st the stress or sweetness, both Ezekiel and John, indicates the privilege and joy of proclaiming God's message. The bitterness which John knew may symbolize the psychological impact of identifying himself with his readers and taking seriously what God says. So we can see here, according to Ezekiel chapter 4, builds a model of a beside city. Okay? In, in Hosea chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, his own family experiences depicted the relation between Jehovah and his people. Now we have also the embalmatic ordinances. In the New Testament, baptism and the Lord's Supper involve. So we have the common material elements, the action of men, and the action of God. Okay, when we talk about baptism, actually in uh, our belief, We are uh, we are practicing these two ordinances, the water baptism and the communion, or we call that Lord's Supper. Now, let's talk about the principles for interpreting symbols. Symbols for interpreting sim interpreting symbols. First, note the qualities of the literal object denoted by the symbol. So you have to check that. Secondly, try to discover from the context the purpose for using a symbol. Third, use any explanation given in the context to connect the symbol and the truth it teaches. If the symbol is not explained, then use every clue found in the immediate context or in any part of the book where the 
figure occurs. Try to state why the symbol was effective for the hearers or readers. I'm sorry, I cannot edit my notes now. I don't know what's uh, wrong with my laptop. Fourth, if a symbol which was clear to the initial readers is not clear to modern readers, state explicitly what the barrier is for the modern reader. That's why I keep on telling you while reading the Word of God, just check the generation of the people whom the writer uh, wrote that message. Okay, so you must know the recipient of that book. Okay, where there is uncertainty of meaning, the interpreters should proceed from those factors of which he is the most sure. Pip, observe the frequency and the distribution of a symbol, but allow its context to control the meaning. Do not force symbols into preconceived schemes of uniformity. Okay. Six, think or meditate upon your results. The reason Paul could glory or boast in the cross of Christ, according to Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, is that he knew how the simple stood for meditation precedes such a response. Okay? Now, let's talk about prophecy, brothers and sisters. I hope you are you, you are following me. Okay? Let's talk about prophecy. A prophet is a spokesman for God who declares God's will to the people. Prophets play a prominent role both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4. We encounter prophets and prophecy throughout the whole Bible from starting from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. So it is imperative that we interpret the prophetic material rights. Now, the sources of the prophetic message. Sources. One question is basic. Uh, uh, please, I cannot edit uh, my book now. Later on, I will check. Where, where, not where, where did the prophet obtain his materials? The word which being spoken. The scriptures take full cognizance of the false prophets who prophesy lies and speak from the deceit of their heart, according to Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 14 to 15. These prophets created their own material without any genuine relationship to the Lord. In one sense, the true prophets created their own material too. For each one's individual style is stamped upon his message or in a vital relationship to God. And it was he who spoke as well as they. Hence, the ways through which the message came to the prophet are important to the interpreter. So we have to understand clearly, huh? please. Now, let's talk about dreams or night visions. Dreams and night vision as media of acquiring knowledge on the part of the prophets have some use, but they should not be regarded as a main method. 
A classic text which refers to this method is Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. If your prophet be of Jehovah, I will make myself known unto him in a vision. Okay, according to Numbers. Now, let's talk about the ecstatic visions. Static visions. A much more common source of information for a prophet is what he saw in an static state. Such an static state was not a self-induced excitement in which the prophet jumped around in an irrational manner. But the state was one in which the prophet had all his mental and spiritual faculties raised to a new level of performance according to Habakkuk chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 29, Job chapter 4, chapter 20, chapter 33, and chapter 14. Now, the true prophet prophesies a vision of truth. He both spoke and wrote the truth of the vision. That's why we are reading the writings of the prophet because that's why we have the prophetic writings. Okay? Now, written truth is stressed in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. So, content-centered is the idea of a vision for the Hebrews that the word vision is used as a title of a book of prophecy. According to Nahum, chapter 1, verse 11, and chap chapter 1 of the book of Babadja. Okay? So we have to distinguish the dream from the vision. Now, let's check this. The direct encounter with God. Direct encounter with God. In dreams and vision, the prophet sees or hears in a manner roughly similar to closed-circuit television. But in direct encounter, God himself is present to the prophet as he makes his disclosures through the word, his speech and declamation, or, de or declaration, according to 2 Kings 20, verse 1 to 6. We see God directly communicating with his prophets. So we have to differentiate the dreams, the vision, and the direct encounter with the Lord. When we say vision is like you are seeing in the television. In dreams you are sleeping. But direct encounter is different. Different. It is because the one, the Lord is the one speaking through your lips. He's just using our tongue. Interaction with events followed by the revelation from the Lord. Earthly interaction followed by divine revelation is a more frequent form of direct encounter with God. It differs from the other in that a specific historical event brings the prophet into a relationship with God because of which the prophet has authoritative message from God to deliver according to Jeremiah chapter 21, chapter 36, and chapter 42, the book of Jeremiah. Now, if you just study the situation of the prophet, you just, please, just read Isaiah chapter 39, 2 Kings chapter 20. So just read, and you will see the life situation of the prophet. You know? So if you are seeing the calling of the prophet, it's very hard to be a prophet. It's very hard to be a prophet. And come again, it's very hard to become a prophet. It's very hard, especially in the Old Testament. Let's talk about the nature of the prophetic message. The nature of the prophetic message. The purpose of this discussion is to prepare 
the wear for a statement of principles to be followed in interpreting prophecy. Now, uh, again, we have to be uh, clearly understand the operation of the prop of prophecy how the prophet deliver the word from god okay a while ago the prophet we have said that he is the spokesman of god so the role of a prophet the, the prophet is a spokesman for god who declares god's will to the people two possible Etymological meaning are both supported by usage to call or to proclaim. They were certainly super proclaimers or messengers of the word of God. They were used of the Lord to examine, prove, or test the people according to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 27. They proclaim Elevatable judgment as well as judgment to be avoided. They were acted both as watchmen and intercessor. They spoke to and out of many kinds of life situation. Come again, as I close, the role of the prophet in the New Testament has much in common with the Old Testament role, although there were some differences according to chapter 2 of the book of Acts. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, as you see from, just go on, read the whole chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. Again, brothers and sisters, we have uh, to understand clearly how uh, the, deep, the, the difference between a dreams, a vision, and a direct encounter with the Lord. Now, our lecture is more on how to interpret prophecy, how to see if the prophet is really speaking the word from the Lord, or he is just speaking words from his heart or from his thinking. Again, we are so thankful, and I'm so thankful this evening, that uh, we see each other again, even though I'm not around for the previous weeks, it is because of my hectic schedules. But I'm so thankful that we are here again, and we will continue to lecture about our subject about Hermeneutics. Come again. Uh, uh, we are praying that the Lord will keep on using us because, brothers and sisters, there are many Paul's prophets, there are many Paul's teachers. The problem is this. Please, I'm not here to condemn. It is not my responsibility and role to say. To, to condemn any people. But again, there are many Paul's prophets and there are many Paul's teachers. It is because the problem sometimes is it is because the minister or the work of the Lord is lack of knowledge about the scripture. Lord, thank you for the word and bless all our brothers and sisters who have heard this word, may the power of the Holy Spirit illuminate the word that we have heard in order for us to have a clear picture and understanding of hermeneutics. Bless us this evening because this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sir uh, Fred Bongato, for uh, uh, allowing me to teach and share the Word of God. Thank you, Sir. God bless us.